I'm George Gallo, and I present Kale Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kale Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kale Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kale Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but talking about Kashmir. Two nuclear armed adversaries fighting each other on a line of control. What could possibly go wrong? Well, absolutely everything. A world ending, existential danger when two nuclear armed adversaries can no longer resolve the issues between them, even by conventional warfare, the possibilities of escalation are obvious, or ought to be. You are probably not an expert on Kashmir. Many of the people in this audience are. I kind of am myself. I hold the two highest civil awards in Pakistan, one of them for my work on Kashmir, but I'm going to be as unbiased, impartial as I can in this debate because there are plenty of people here with strong views. Let me go to the core of the problem, at least as far as I see it. The situation in Kashmir is another British imperial crime, another British mess. At exactly the same time, as Britain was creating or creating the conditions to create the decades of Israel-Palestine confrontation, conflagration, mass misery, poverty and killing, we were doing the same thing in Kashmir. We were doing the same thing when we decided to partition the subcontinent of India into two countries then two countries, India and Pakistan, but without taking any care to ascertain the popular will in the places that were being allocated to one new country or the other. In the case of Kashmir, though, it was a flagrant, absolutely blatant provocation. The great majority of the population of Jammu and Kashmir were Muslim and wanted to go to Pakistan. The problem was their ruler, a prince, a maharaja, was more keen on joining India. So he, one man, capriciously decided to take the whole territory into India, which was not accepted by the population of Jammu and Kashmir then or now, perhaps even more now than then. The conflict was immediate and dangerous, though no nuclear weapons were present at the time. Both countries were allied to superpowers. India, for many decades, allied to the former Soviet Union under the leadership of the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, and Pakistan, though with a friendship with China, always an ally of the United States. So dangerous from the start, even before they got their own nuclear weapons. Finally, the matter came before the United Nations Security Council, which decided that there must be a plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir so that the people peacefully, on a ballot paper, could decide their destiny. This has never been implemented. And this is the core of the problem. It's the legal, international legal basis for the uh, Kashmiri people's demand for self-determination. It is an inalienable right, after all. What's the meaning of the word inalienable? Many people use it. Fewer know what it means. Inalienable means that no one can take it away from you. It is not limited by time that your inalienable rights are your inalienable rights forever, whether they are exercised or whether someone is preventing you from exercising them. Now, I don't know what the people 
of Jammu and Kashmir would do in a plebiscite, it might very well be that they would choose something other than joining Pakistan or remaining in India. One thing is for sure, the status quo isn't working. India is forced to deploy 600,000 soldiers to maintain its hold on Indian-held Kashmir. That's not uh, tenable, either economically nor morally, in the future. The people in Kashmir have risen up, more or less again in coterminity with the Intifada in Palestine, almost the same year. An Intifada began in Kashmir and it has never died. But more than 100,000 people have died. Mass incarceration, allegations of torture and the use of rape as a weapon of war. Now, India is a great country, not just great in size, not just great in military power, but an economic and cultural superpower in the world. Nobody in their right mind wants to be an enemy of India. But it's my point of view that until this Kashmir problem is resolved democratically, by plebiscite, as called for by the United Nations, there will never be normality in relations uh, within the state, within the territory it claims but is disputed, and between people like me and India. That's my point of view. I've got some distinguished experts in the hall and one or two enthusiastic amateurs too. Let's take the first expert. Yes, sir. Please say your name and give us your point of view. Um, I'm, I'm Samir Mahmood. I practice as a barrister in immigration and human rights here uh, in the UK. Uh, my concern is that where you have an imbalance of uh, the, the higher powers backing in the individual countries, then that can often translate into what, what the ground reality becomes. Uh, Palestine is a case in point. Uh, Israel rece receives billions of dollars of support from the United States, uh, and that has uh, a lot to do with the, the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, what What do you think? Uh, it, it, it's often despairing to 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 observe what's happening in Kashmir. Uh, uh, Seventy years on, nothing has been resolved. Um, again, there are the powers who are either neutral or or backing one side or the other. Do you, what, what do you think will need to change on the international front for there to be a solution-based approach rather than a battle-based approach? Well, if, uh, if there was oil in, uh, in the valley of Kashmir, of course, the international community would already long since have been heavily engaged. But there's no oil, as far as we know. Uh, um, and maybe it'll make things worse if you discover it. Uh, there's no oil, there's only blood and tears and the international community not much interested in uh, the blood and tears of brown people. That's the brutal uh, reality uh, in the world. Um, the danger of nuclear conflict is a wake-up call. So the events recently uh, on the line of control uh, with uh, India and Pakistan exchanging fire uh, very expensive uh, military jets being uh, brought down. Uh, that has uh, focused more attention than hitherto uh, on the situation. India's stance is clear, and it's one that we share everywhere else in the world, uh, a fear, loathing of terrorism. Uh, not national liberation struggle, but acts of terrorism which... Uh, wound and maim and kill entirely innocent people, civilian people, in pursuit of a political cause. So when they see a collection of people in a camp uh, in uh, Azad Kashmir, Pakistani-controlled Kashmir, they're going to attack that camp, and that's what they did. And Pakistan's going to defend its territory and its sovereignty, so it fought back. Jets came down. There was a flurry of uh, anxiety, maybe even more than anxiety in the international community. I think we have to try and force this issue 
uh, further onto the international agenda. But that will require a number of things to change. Maybe they are changing. But Pakistan does not have a good reputation in the world. Pakistan is not loved in the world in the way that India is loved, partly because India is much richer and uh, it's kind of easier to love someone who might buy your stuff and uh, might, uh, um, might, might, might draw you into its uh, soft power, its cultural orbit. India has a very high level of soft power, cultural power in the world. Putting it bluntly, India is much more popular in the world than Pakistan. And Pakistan has partly itself to blame uh, for that. Uh, whilst India has elected governments, prime ministers change, they lose the election, they move out of prime minister's house the next day. Uh, uh, that's not the case in Pakistan. Pakistan has had military dictatorship, rigged elections, uh, thieving prime ministers. Uh, these are all the reasons why there is an imbalance, not just the brute uh, political uh, reality. Sorry if that hurt your feelings, but that's my view. Yes, madam. Yes, so basically I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about um, the conflict <clears throat> of Kashmir as such. Um, as we know that uh, the legacy that has been left behind by the you know, British um, colonize, uh, colonizers, the way that they basically artificially divided the territories was to create a sort of um, an internal uh, you know, um, confusion among the people in those regions. Obviously, when this happened, and we see for the last so many years, I mean, Kashmir is still the bone of contention between these two countries. Um, Two regions obviously had gone to uh, Pakistan, which was one was um, uh, the uh, Azad Kashmir and the other one is the G uh, Gilgit Baltistan. And the, for India, it was the Jammu and the Ladakh area and the Kashmir Valley. So Jammu and the Ladakh area are happy to actually uh, be a part of the Indian, under the Ind Indian rule, but the Kashmir Obviously, Kashmir is because it's a Muslim majority sort of feel uh, that, uh, you know, for so many years, uh, all their laws and rights have been impinged by the Indian, you know, um, uh, you know military uh, rule there. And I think it, it is interesting to see that when we look at this, these regions as such, we see how multicultural and multi-ethnic these regions are. Um, I mean, how we need to go about towards a sort of a resolution, you know, or, or create a certain, you know, sort of a solution for this sort of, um, you know, problem to actually be alleviated is, is to actually understand that we have these different groups, different multicultural ethnic, uh, you know, groups in these regions who have their own political, you know, sort of aspirations. And all these leaders from both the countries actually need to sit together and bring together all these different parties to understand their grievances. Uh, obviously, we see now and again that in Kashmir Valley, there has been, you know, a lot of human rights violation. In 1989, there was, in, you know, in, um, insurgency uh, by the Kashmiri youth at that point. They came to this point that they basically now, you know, completely alienate themselves from the Indian, uh, you know, rule. Uh, and, and this is still very much strong in there. So if you see any Kashmiri, you know, a normal Kashmiri young person, you talk to them, you will actually feel how much they alienated they feel from the Indian rule. So I think both the parties basically need to actually come together and start the CBMs that they started, you know, back in the 19, uh, you know, 90s. Start looking at the conf conf confidence building measures start taking these you know different political um, you know aspirations of these groups and understand what the grievances what the problems are unless they don't sit there I don't think that they will be able to solve any problem because we know from the very beginning that um, India and Pakistan both have their geostrategic interests. Um, the reason that they are nuclear weapons power are because of their geostrategic interests. India first uh, tested their nuclear bomb in 1974, calling it a smiling Buddha. Obviously, they said it for peaceful purposes. And later on, we saw in, in, in 1998, uh, Pakistan testing their nuclear weapons. And obviously, both of them resorting to no first uh, nuclear you know, policy but Pakistan has been quite ambiguous about their policy as such. So I think um, the other thing that I think we need to take into the triangle is the other 
powers that are actually have geostrategic interest in these countries, like China, like Russia. Now, Russia and India from during the Cold War period had a very good relationship, building their you know strategic, having a very good strategic partnership. At the same time, they have helped India actually create a nuclear triad. They have helped with the uh, you know a submarine missile, which is called Brahmos, uh, which gives India quite a superiority in their um, you know missile uh, system. At the same time. Um, you know, you, you need, I mean, these are the sort of consideration and the, and the sort of things we need to consider in terms of understanding what that, that triangle is all about. Um, also, we, we saw that how U.S. was interested in, in Pakistan during, you know, uh, uh, you know, the 1960s, how, you know, uh, Russia was actually helping India. And then again, we see China's, um, you know, relationship with Pakistan at the moment that creates a bit of animosity, you know, um, uh, for, you know, India because they feel that, you know, perhaps this is something that, you know, we need to work on because China itself is a part of a BRIC nation, a rising power, uh, again, a rising emerging economy, India the same. So I think all the parties actually need to sit together and understand what are these different political, you know, ideologies that are coming from these different groups from different parts of Kashmir. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. Uh, Adam Gary, you're a historian. Um, neutral in, this, in the sense you're neither Indian nor Pakistani. Uh, what do you think of what you've heard uh, so far from our distinguished guests and from me? Well, I agree with the vast majority of it, but I would say getting back to the issue of the three parts of Indian-occupied Kashmir that you just mentioned, Jammu is a very interesting case because depending on whose figures one is to believe, there was indeed such an ethnic cleansing at the hands of the RSS terror organization, a paramilitary group incidentally aligned with the ruling party BJP in India, a massacre which began in October of 1940 is said by many historians and statisticians to have changed the demographic balance in Jammu in order to try and give New Delhi a permanent excuse to deadlock this debate that otherwise would have been a clear case of majority rule, as, for example, it was in South Africa or Zimbabwe. And nevertheless, to me, that's no excuse to delay the implementation of Resolution 47, which the the UN Security Council passed in 1948. And I do look at the two sides and their interests and China and Russia and, of course, the United States. And at the end of the day, the fault lies with India, particularly under this current government. Modi, for example, has not renounced this so-called Greater India Plan, which at its most conservative with a small c would see India annexing Pakistan and the former East Pakistan, Bangladesh. A more wild interpretation of this aggressive expansionist ideology would see India absorb Afghanistan and Myanmar and Nepal and Bhutan. This is an ideology which fills the social media pages, not of people on the fringe, but of people who are members of the BJP, people who are members of regional assemblies, people who are members of the parliament. And so when one realizes the lack of reason with whom Pakistan would have to be negotiating with, it goes a long way to explain the deadlock and the bloodshed and the lack of any justice. Just on answering the final point that's been raised about perception, I think this latest round of skirmishes that we've seen has been a watershed because we can all talk about hard power, which is important. We can talk about justice, which is the pivotal, the most important issue here. But then there's soft power, there's perception. And I agree, George, with everything you said about this perception, I think Imran Khan needs to be given more credit than in fact he's being given for shifting this dynamic. Pakistan has indeed suffered from corrupt prime ministers, corrupt generals acting as presidents, the title that they conveniently assign themselves. But what Imran has done is to clearly and articulate Pakistan's position, which many previous people in his position and in a presidential position were unable to do. At the same time, whilst Modi talks to himself and to his own wild base before an election, and it can't be forgotten that this entire so-called surgical strike 2.0 was electioneering written in blood rather than ink. Um, there's been a change in perception, and it is moving slowly, but when people see the professionalism and the 
the dignity and the worldly manner of Imran on one side of the screen and the shrieking, frankly, lunatic voices coming from Indian TV channels, and I won't name them, but one search online and people can see what they are. Slowly but surely, things are changing. My only humble advice for the PTI government was be to be more assertive, even more clear, and speak as though the world is listening. Because when a diplomat and when a politician speaks as though the world is listening, eventually they will listen. It was uh, a big mistake uh, partitioning the subcontinent, wasn't it? Uh, and if it hadn't happened, we wouldn't be having this discussion. And India would be uh, would have the biggest Muslim population uh, in the world, and India would be united and uh, even richer and more successful than India is. Well, that was certainly the initial view of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the great founding father of Pakistan. He was very late to come to the two nations theory, but there were several things that indeed convinced him that partition was a necessary evil. Let's put it that way. And for me, obviously, everything you said in normal geopolitical conditions would be absolutely right. And today, if things were ideal, I'm all for unity. I'm for Belt and Road bringing countries together. Together. I think protectionism is stupid and in some cases wicked. So I'm all for countries on a purely voluntary and democratic basis being more rather than less united. But when people read the theories of these so-called Hindutva philosophers, as they call themselves, that long predated even discussions of partition, these were in the first decades of the 20th century. And when one reads that they say that rape against Muslim women is not only a viable political tool and is permissible but is even virtuous. This sick philosophy, which for many years was sort of kept on the fringes of Indian society under Congress rule, though it always crept up when certain people needed to win certain elections or gain certain uh, aid and succor from other sources. But now that is the mainstream. It's no longer hiding behind a mosque. It's no longer hiding behind the ideals of pluralism and secularism. And and so we can say with the benefit of hindsight that the journey that Jinnah took from a one nation to a two nations theory has tragically been vindicated, not by anything Pakistan yeah. has done, but by Although these Hindu extremists. Although if there had been no extremists. partition, you'd have uh, all the Pakistanis and all the Bangladeshis voting in Indian elections. That would change the paradigm somewhat. It's, it's absolutely the other side of that coin, but that wouldn't make the RSS go away. It would numerically diminish them, and that would obviously be a very good thing, but they'd still be there. And I think the events of October in Jammu is one of the reasons that many people are not only proud Pakistanis, but are also defenders of this two-nation theory, although, of course, as you say, it can cut both ways. Much more of this after the break. You're watching Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maedin Television, coming from London, talking about Kashmir. We took the Kale Mahora camera onto the streets of London to hear what the people thought. Let's take a look. Do you think the current conflict and tensions in Kashmir can ever be resolved? It's a complicated issue, definitely, but they can be resolved. Um, I mean, my family comes from Pakistan, so this is a subject that I've known about for a while, and of course, we do hear about it all the time on the news. And I think ultimately, it won't be solved through fighting. Negotiation is the biggest way to resolve a conflict, mm. and the biggest way to do that is by respect and listen to each other. I think listening is the key to everything. Well, I believe, leave it to, on the people of Kashmir, you know, do a referendum. This is what we call a democracy, you know. So whatever they decide, let them choose whether they want to be a uh, part of Pakistan, whether they want to be a part of India, you know, or whether they want to be themselves. There are just economic issues about it and so that's why they're actually fighting for uh, the Kashmir. If you try to find an agreement between India and Pakistan, uh, you can also just like create a sort of uh, um, special territory where it's not neither uh, Indian or Pakistan's. Uh, Pakistani people and Indian people, they live in peace. 
uh, either by by religion or either by like as a as a human being. I myself am a global citizen person. I love those nations. I have a few friends from both sides, from both countries, and all I wish for them is a peace. Do you think the current tensions have anything to do with the politics internal to India and Pakistan? I think it's mostly a political problem, problematic what they have between the both countries, either Pakistan or India. This is all because of the uh, elections going on in India, you know. Anyone, even a blind can see why this all happening, you know. The uh, current prime minister, the elections going on, so his whole uh, uh, politics based on this uh, uh, anti-Pakistan or anti-Muslim thing, you know. There's definitely some fueling of tension from both sides. You can't say one side is to blame and the other is not. It's clear that they are both involved somewhat. I think especially with, we know that the Indian elections are coming up, and there are a lot of people who say that perhaps the recent uh, tensions and attacks and so on are feeding into Modi's favour. Times like this, they should really set aside their differences and focus on what's important. What about the people that are in Kashmir who are suffering from this like tension going around daily lives? That's so something to look forward to when you wake up every morning, is it? But anyway, the war is not good. Peace is what we like. My colleague is from India. Many people from India, we are all friends. Yes. People who are educated, they know what peace is. You know, they don't want a war. There's nothing in it. You know. He's my favourite shopkeeper so far. Uh, let's, uh, uh, yeah, you, sir. Uh, my name's Akib. I uh, just wanted to touch on uh, something that um, Adam mentioned about the demographic changes. There's certain uh, rumours going on, and I think this might come to the fore after the election, that Article 35A, which restricts non-Kashmiris from buying land in, in Jammu and Kashmir, um, uh, is, going to, is coming under question now in India, and that might be abolished. And they're going to try, perhaps, to change the demographics of Kashmir uh, in order to negate the plebiscite demand of Pakistan, which Pakistan constantly asks for uh, the resolution of the Kashmir issue according to the United Nations uh, resolution. Uh, and India always rejects that because it knows or it fears that there's a popular will to join Pakistan, especially in the valley. And perhaps they might try and do West Bank-style settlements where they... Uh, scatter the Muslim population or the Muslim majority population of Kashmir and install uh, kind of Hindutva uh, style hardcore right wing uh, Hindu nationalists who will come and change the demographics and change the ground reality is one of the phrases we heard we always hear about the Palestine and Israel uh, uh, debate that the ground realities can't be changed because the settlements are so large and there's millions of settlers now the ground realities can't be changed even though the settlements, everyone acknowledges them as illegal under international law, but they've become uh, non-negotiable for Israel. So th that's the kind of fear that people have now uh, about what Modi might do in order to appease this kind of right-wing uh, rhetoric that he's whipped up so much. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Well, it's a very uh, somber, portentous uh, new factor. Uh, if it were to happen, I would have thought it would be of itself, uh, a casus belli, I would have thought it would lead to war, uh, were that to happen. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Amanullah Khan. I'm an uh, anti-imperialist founding father of Pakistan People's Party. I would uh, just uh, appreciate Mr. Adams' views and analysis, but I would like to point out to your good self, you being... Uh, uh, an anti-imperialist uh, fighter of international uh, fame, you know, and reputation. And you've done a lot to make this world a better place. The thing is this, that Pakistan was not created only by the efforts of Mr. Jinnah. It was created as from the belly of hatred of the Indian Brahmin society. Because no Muslim wanted to shoot uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I, as a Muslim and as a socialist, I say he was a Mahatma. He was uh, preaching peace. But the West must not play tricks, you know, with this soft power or hard power, you know. For example, for the sake of corporate God, the, the, the corporate uh, greed God, you know, why the hell you are not resolving this problem, you know? And this is your bounden duty. 
because mind you pakistan is not a sleeping uh, a sleeping power you know it is a bloody very strong nuclear power and it means business the americans must not forget that it was because of pakistan that uh, uh, unreasonably soviet union was dismembered you know because at least soviet union was a symbol of socialism you know socialism for uh, a message of hope for the dalits for the oppressed for the for, for the poorest people you know so it is high time the uh, the superpowers who are holding monopolistically you know uh, the seat of the security council they must uh, drive this business ahead you know and tell uh, really uh, solve this problem and i otherwise i tell you don't take it as a joke pakistan would uh, would not uh, would not be the first to trigger the weapon nuclear weapon but it has a nuclear weapon awfully 1000 times more powerful than hiroshima and nagasaki thank you very much gentlemen in the middle with the glasses hi george my name is shiram malik i'm a cyber security expert and i'm originally from pakistan i'd like to challenge you on two points to th that you made one was the terrorist camps that are only based in pakistan this originated from the fact that india supported mukti bani who are classed as terrorists today in the 60s to break up east pakistan so we got to remember that before you this pakistan for doing what they did in the 80s we must look at it historically that's one point second point i'd like to make is let's focus on two things that the, that the gentleman said over there strategically this current episode might have uh, given narendra modi a boost in the polls and why does he need a boost in the polls is the question that hasn't been asked or answered yet and shashi tharoor and we all know who shashi tharoor is a very famous diplomat who served as under security uh, under uh, secretary to uh, united nations and i'm quoting him now the reason they need to win this election is to change the indian constitution this is the analysis of most experts around the world and what are those two changes there's going to be two changes now what happens in the parliamentary system of government apart from britain is the upper house of parliament is staggered so for example bjp won majority in the last election but they don't have a majority in the upper house the next elected upper house no matter who wins the current election will be based on the number of seats that bjp won in the last election so they will have a majority in the upper house so for them to pass through any amendments to the constitution they need two thirds majority in the lower house two thirds majority in the upper house and two thirds majority in the state electorate they control 22 states right the federal government elections are going to happen now if they win this election then the constitution can be changed so what are the two changes in the constitution number 1 they say that the constitution of india was written by westernized barristers and lawyers so it needs to comply with the will of the indian people that's one change i think they can live with that second change and crucially and this is where the hindutva ideology comes in india a uh, definition of an indian will change an indian will not be anybody living within the geographical boundary of what is india today but the people who represent the culture of india so it's nationality through exclusivity so only a hindu only a hindu will be an indian a full citizen of india no that's uh, a rather large leap in logic no I'm all in favor of uh, an Indian being defined as someone expressing the culture no, of no, India. No, no, why, why did you leap to Hindu? This is not a my Sikh, a Sikh is representing the culture no, of no, India and in, no, an Indian Muslim is representing the culture of India. That's the problem. That's what the Congress party and majority of minorities in India fear. I mean that's the whole this whole charade of what has happened. Okay. Well, very interesting. Let me take the gentleman in front of you. My name is uh, Sayyid Andrabi. I'm originally from Srinagar and living here for the past 23 years. Uh, Just for the international audience, Srinagar is the capital, the capital of, of Kashmir. Kashmir yeah. And uh, I have been recognized by uh, United Nations 
uh, charter as refugee in this country. I have been in the political forefront in Kashmir uh, during this freedom movement and before this also. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, if if I had to if I had to assess what you said about Kashmir conflict, I would say hundred percent, ten out of ten. You summed it up very wonderfully, very beautifully. That's what Kashmir conflict is. The problem with us is these days. I have been last week also. We had a couple of Kashmir conferences. The problem is that it is historically a bilateral thing. It happened between India and Pakistan. And uh, I myself organized a conference in 2001 in SOAS. Uh, I'm sorry I did not invite you. Uh, I, I feel sorry now. But uh, I, some experts were there, like Alistair Lamb, Victoria Schofield, others. Uh, and my, my point in the conference was that Kashmir issue is essentially Pakistan's issue. Pakistan should keep crying about Kashmir. Pakistan should keep claiming Kashmir because Pakistan should say, as India consolidated its domain by going to Hyderabad, Junagadh, doing all the massacre, whatever it did, nobody gives a damn to it. Every, now they have a statue of Patel installed in Gujarat. They called it unity statue because he brought unity to India. Someone in Pakistan should have done the same they should have looked what belongs to Pakistan. The Muslim Kashmir belonged to it. They should have claimed it. They could not, but they should have continued it. So I argued that this is basically Pakistan's problem. And this was our theme of the conference. But now, much water has flown down the bridge. And I tell you, George, in the, in the last week's conferences on Kashmir, which I was referring to, the predominant theme is that this problem is now it is ours. We are, we are suffering. I, I am here. I would have not been here. I, I did. I was, I was on the faculty of University of Kashmir, and I, I would have not, nobody in senses would have migrated. But we have, uh, and, and now, after these pallet guns, after killings, and after what BJP did, just before Pulwama, Pulwama was a great... <laughs> I mean, it, it, it obfuscated everything. Now, before Pulwama, what was happening in Kashmir, and I tell you, this last government of PDP, they had a finance minister, Dr. Hesib Drabu. Dr. Hesib Drabu is a good intellectual, and he was the finance minister. He wrote, in, uh, uh, he wrote, uh, he wrote an article, and he said, the BJP policy in Kashmir is they are incentivizing death. They are giving rewards. They are giving money to people. Bring us a dead body. They are not incentivizing surrender. They should have been giving money to people. If you make one young man surrender, we will give you money. No. They are telling them, get corpse. Get dead body of one man, we'll give you money. So they are out to finish our generation. And when Pulwama happened, the whole world focused on 40 CRPF paramilitary people killed there, and it completely obfuscated the basic truth, what's happening in Kashmir. So my point, George, is that, yes, bilateral, no, no doubt. But now, can you suggest, can you tell me, how can the Kashmiri voice be heard now? Because Kashmiris are the people who are suffering. Mm. Now, in Jammu, they are very romantic mm. with India, mm. absolutely romantic. Mm. And uh, I will briefly tell you, my, my, my uncle, my father's small little brother, my father could never recover from the shock. He was killed in 1947, right in Jammu, when they did that demographic cleaning. So we, we, have, we have been suffering, and we have to see what's... What, what, what can be done in this regard? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I can't. Uh, <clears throat> I can't do much for you because your people voted me out of parliament. Uh, maybe you should go to the person they voted for. Uh, let's take this lady here. Go ahead. Um, you know, what, all the views that that's been shared, we agree on 
everything that people are saying. But I just feel that when we talk about India and Kashmir, we're almost talking about like a territorial thing, but we forget the main people like you just mentioned, Kashmiris, who are the sufferers right now in this conflict are Kashmiri people. The biggest human right violation that's going on, you know, in terms of the rape, in terms of the use of pellet gum, excessive force, it's been known now that it is the the biggest military regime in the world. Yes, yes. Not just in a region, in the world. 600,000 in that small area. It's the biggest, the most militarized area in the world, yeah. Exactly. And it's the most long-lasting conflict that's not been resolved either in the world. That's gone on like 70 years. It was left uh, halfway through by uh, British people when they left. Uh, um, divided into India and Pakistan. Well, we're not going to even talk about why they sh we're not united, we would be better. It's done now. The only thing when this wasn't resolved and it should have been followed up, mm -hmm. but I feel both Pakistan and India use it for their own agendas, political and state agendas, but they're not thinking Kashmiris as the people who are suffering. feel there should be a quadrilateral uh, sort of involvement in this. There are big global uh, players in here. They all need to have the input. That should be United Nations. So Pakistan, India, obviously bilaterally because they're they're part of this. Kashmiri people to be put in the forefront of everything. They should be given the right. Looking back into you know the United Nation um, in 1948 when they had the resolution saying that they should be. If only the Pakistan and Indian forces would have retreated, then they would have given them this referendum choice where in Kashmir people get to say. But right now, we live in a global village. We get affected. We get the news straight away. So it's not a news. These atrocities were happening since the time, you know, 70 years back. But they reach to us more and they affect us more. We can yeah. see it more visually and we get connected. But at the same yeah. time, we are more powerful now. We have players who should work around it. So the main thing is to get the Kashmiri people to get this referendum. The same way like the, you know, um, yeah, UK people are having Scottish, this. Scottish, uh, the British, yes, the, the Brexit. Catalans, everyone's yeah. got a, And so, there are processes going on all over the world. There are there exactly. are talks on multiple yeah. levels, on multiple So United Nations, I feel, need to do more. Here. United yeah, Nations need have to, to be involved more. Them. Ask, ask Putin. He, he might be able to fix it. Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the middle row. Assalamu alaikum, George, and... Uh, very interesting points made by everyone. I'll keep it brief because I know a lot of people want to speak. Um, I think one issue we may have missed is the Israeli influence on the uh, Indian regime. Right now, whatever you hear from the illegitimate state of Israel, from Netanyahu, Bezaz or Samotric, all of those Jewish fanatics, you will hear that exact same line a few months later from the RSS, from the BJP whether it's uh, Shiv Sena, Israel is quite an ally of India now. Definitely, and uh, many of you might know, but the recent attack, the failed uh, Indian attack against uh, Pakistan on the LOC was a joint Israeli-Indian attack. It failed. The Israelis haven't acknowledged it, but we know this. It's an open secret. So Israel very much involved in the uh, occupation of Kashmir. And with Article 35A, it's already being abrogated. It hasn't been officially uh, passed through the courts. But there are um, Hindutva, Hindu extremists being imported from different parts of India into uh, occupied Kashmir. And before what you used to Where see... Where did we uh, see that? Where did we see that before? Exactly. Yeah, uh, it's the, the same as the West right. Bank, uh, as they did in Hebron uh, and it's elsewhere. Exactly. Exactly. The West Bank. Uh, so it's going towards war, I think, I think. May yeah. I take the gentleman at the back sure. in the glasses? Uh, my name is Ahmed and I am from uh, Gilgit, Baltistan, which is also part of Welcome. this Kashmir issue. Um, yeah, I want to. I would like to uh, comment about two issues. One is the parties in discussion. At the moment, what's happening is like uh, always when there are discussions, is Pakistan and India, and they put their their views on what they want. But I think the basic thing should be what the people of this region want, and that's the basic thing. And I, I never seen people from Gilgit Baltistan ask that what they want in this issue. Um, and the second thing is, uh, I would like to say, is, uh, the basic right in these regions. I'm from Gilgit, Baltistan, but I cannot vote for the general election, um, but I can vote as a student in UK for Brexit. So, which is very, <laughs> very strange. I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I would say that if, um, if this, this issue, the first thing, if you want to resolve this issue, engage all the parties who are suffering. And the second thing is the, all these in this region, people should have all the 
basic human rights or democratic rights. Now, is your territory covered in the United Nations Security Council resolution? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Which Mr. Nehru promised to uh, accept, by the way. Yeah. Mr. Nehru, the great Indian Prime Minister, independence, accepted the Security Council resolution and said that he would implement it. Are, is your territory covered in that? Yeah, yeah, but a lot of people don't know the history that the people from that area actually fought for their freedom and then they they made a deal with Pakistan and and be, became a part of Pakistan but then again the confusion that made I think that maybe uh, a, a not a good move from Pakistani including that again into this issue mm. uh, which uh, mm. that the people of that area don't like mm. at all okay gentlemen here uh, so, Hil Qureshi uh, from Axiom Productions, we worked with Pakistani and Indian artists. We got friends from both sides and collaborators as well. Um, my, uh, my topic uh, to discuss my point is um, there is a report from United Nations last year uh, um, on human rights uh, violations uh, about Kashmir. So, we, can we not use this report to provoke international um, media and international, uh, you know, the um, main powers and allies, let's say uh, UK, um, European countries like Germany can take a part as well, and especially US, and use that report and go for a solution. I know we all talk about the problems we are having in Kashmir, but can we really go for a solution? Can we really use this report? Is it really... Uh, credible enough to to be used as a solution? Well, the, the human rights of some people are more valuable than the human rights of others, yeah. uh, as everyone watching this program knows. So human rights violations against Kashmiri people uh, will send most uh, Western media and political figures to sleep. Uh, they don't uh, care about that. The life of blood and life of some people is worth more than the blood and life of others. Yeah, just a quick question. So, uh, w in your opinion, what can we do to provoke uh, international powers and to f force, like, let's say, Pakistan and India both to come to a solution? And I'm, I'm in that favor as well. I don't want this to go to Pakistan only. Uh, I'm in that favor that people of Kashmir needs to decide that, uh, whatever has been decided in 1948 as well. Mm -hmm. But the problem is whatever is happening in the United Nations or whatever, even there's a report or there's a resolution uh, which has been offered, it has been accepted uh, mm -hmm. uh, by the Prime Minister at that time. But how can we go for a solution? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do talk on debates. We do go for protests as well. Uh, Indians are protesting as well against you know Pakistan or we all know what's happening mm -hmm. in central London as well. <clears throat> well, you have to box clever and you have to make the right alliances and you have to get your issue onto the agenda. Uh, and uh, insofar as that has been lacking, uh, I've tried to give some of the reasons why that might, that might be so. Uh, time is against us, I'm afraid, uh, in this. I need to take uh, our closing speakers. I'm going to take uh, the... Uh, lady at the front uh, first. I forgot to mention my name and everything. Uh, my name is Dr. Annie Wakar and I'm a lecturer and a researcher in uh, university. I guessed that. <laughs> right. Uh, so basically, um, I feel that um, there is a very big problem at the moment on an international area, uh, arena. We see uh, right-wing uh, populist regimes coming into power. And that has created a lot of uh, sort of discrepancy in understanding how this is actually going to unfold. And unfortunately for India as well, um, you know, they have actually got these Hindutva vigilantes uh, in the areas who are actually out there, you know, um, sort of killing people uh, who are defiling their, you know, religious beliefs. And I think that becomes a very, very, uh, you know, pertinent issue that how do you actually go about um, sort of uh, resolving this major issue where you are you are facing in the international area all these right-wing populist regimes coming into power. You see that even with the United States of America, you see that in Brazil, you see in the, some of the European countries, and you see now in South Asia. So it has become that sort of a boiling, melting point at the moment. And I do feel, like I mentioned before, that it's very important for all the parties to come together and think about what needs to be done about the Kashmiris. Talks. I mean, uh, if I were you, I'd be demanding talks. I'd be, absolutely, I'd, be, absolutely. I'd be demanding a peace process. Yes, That's absolutely. That's the language to use. That's exactly uh, and, uh, what it and is. And I would demand that, uh, that Russia and China and the United States and the European Union uh, convened 
uh, a process, convened talks. Exactly. That's what I'd be demanding. Exactly, George. And I think the other second and most important thing is the fear that these Indian military troops have actually left in the hearts of these Kashmiri Valley people. If you go there and ask, and I actually they do don't look tend to... to me. Uh, the, the, the Kashmiri people's struggle is valiant beyond words. Absolutely. But the fear and, and that they belong... this is the point for India. It's never going to go away. You can't kill your way out of this yeah. problem. Yeah. Because their children and their children and their children Absolutely. will keep raising that banner. And it's just not about killing people with bullets. It's missing persons. I mean, thousands and thousands of people have been missing. I mean, we even ourselves conducted a conference with we had all the Kashmiri women who came and talked about all the missing persons who have not been. They have not been even told whether they're still there in the jails or what has happened to them or did you know what, what exactly where did they go? Where did they disappear? So I think that these are the things that they need to not start. You know, and how do we go about it to actually definitely to somehow you know create this uh, awareness internationally? I do feel that with, with this popular regimes, it, it has become even more harder uh, to actually, you know, sort of instill some sort of this uh, understanding that, yes, there are these human rights abuses, uh, massive human rights abuses that are taking place across, you know, down in South Asia. And I think there needs to be definitely be done something by the international community. Yes. Well, that's all we've got time for, alas. Uh, the show is shorter now. Uh, we could have kept this one going for another hour or two. Uh, you may think that all of this is in a far-off place of which you know little. Hopefully you know a little more after the show. You may think that it isn't really anything to do with you. Uh, but it is. As a human being, it is something to do with you. But even if I can't get you on that, if I can't pull your heartstrings, let me pull you with this. If this situation continues to deteriorate and India and Pakistan go to war, you may just see the first exchange of nuclear weapons on the planet since 1945. And as both countries have superpower allies, it could be the end for all of you. So wake up, people, to the problem of Kashmir. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahorra on Al Maideen Television.